Norma McCourty is a na name you might not know. Uh, some of you may recognize that name, but for the most of you, you probably don't recognize the name of Norma McCourty. Norma was a woman who had a difficult life. She um, was in a married young and was in a difficult marriage and had a child and she wasn't able to take care of that child and she put that child up for adoption. And then she had another bad relationship and she had a series of events in her life and, and she had another child and, that, and that, she didn't keep that child either. And then she found herself uh, pregnant again and her husband whom she was wanting to divorce um, and she had this, this baby and she really didn't want to keep that child. And Norman McCorvey, you may not recognize that name, but you probably are more familiar with her name under the legal status of Jane Roe and Roe versus Wade. She was the woman behind the landmark case that made abortion legal in the United States. And, you know, this is uh, Sunday is Sanctity of Life Sunday, where we celebrate all human life, the life of the unborn, and the life of those who are living as well. And the interesting thing about uh, Norman McCorvey is that after that landmark event, she never had an abortion. She ended up having a total of three children. But she went on to live a lifestyle that was, was a very, very difficult, uh, very, um, very challenging. She got involved in a lesbian lifestyle. But interestingly enough, in 1994, things started to take a turn for her. And she realized that, that the way that she was going was not a good way. And in 2004, she ended up making a, a commitment to become a Christ follower. And she said that she wanted to work the rest of her life to undo the damage that had been caused by the landmark case that was based around who she was. This is a woman who experienced God's forgiveness on a very, very deep level. You know, this series about flexible, we've talked about growing in flexibility. We looked at first about, you know, the compassion and the ability to comfort others is learning from our situation and being flexible to grow through our situation. Last week we saw the, that Paul manifested flexibility as an expression of his confidence to change plans, even while he was confronting wrong attitudes and actions in the church in, in Corinth. And that was a very difficult thing to have confidence in the midst of confrontation. And it was really challenging. But this week we're going to see that uh, discipline that is administered for the purpose of forgiveness and reconciliation can be a healing thing. And so, as we continue in this, this, this whole concept of grow and growing in flexibility, this week we're going to look specifically at the follow-up from last week's difficult confrontation to the healing balm of forgiveness. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read together verses 5 through 11. If you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. If you have your electronic device, you can turn to your Bible there. And I'm reading out of the ESV version. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. This passage, as we're looking in this, this 2 Corinthians theme, 
is the follow-up from Paul's difficult first words. It's interesting to see the progression that Paul makes through 2 Corinthians. He starts off with words of comfort, and then he moves from the words of comfort to really give a, 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 a confident but difficult rebuke. And all of this is leading up to the, this next phase where he, he talks about the whole concept of forgiveness. You see, Paul had to do some very difficult things when he was working with the Corinthians. If you remember from the, the first message, Paul had some history with the church in Corinth. It was a church that had problems with, with divisiveness and division. It was, they had problems with immorality. They had problems with his authority as an apostle. And this letter, to a large degree, is defending his apostleship and his biblical authority in their lives. And so you can imagine this is a very challenging letter because it seems disingenuous. He's saying, look, there are things in your lives that need to take place, and I'm God's person to speak into your lives. And they're saying, well, what gives you the right to speak into our lives? And so it's a very awkward position for him to be in. But you see, Paul cares so deeply about these Corinthians that he's willing to say difficult things because it's based on the truth of God's Word and he wants to build into their lives so they can experience freedom and transformation. The main idea that I want you to get today from this passage that we're looking at is that forgiveness frees us from emotional and spiritual bondage. As we dissect this passage, there's some things that are very specific to Paul and his relationship with the Corinthian church, but there is a principle that extrapolates out that applies to us today, and that principle is that forgiveness frees us from emotional and spiritual bondage. We're going to look a little bit more about the, the depths of that freedom and how it plays out for both the one extending forgiveness and the one receiving forgiveness. But this whole concept of freedom truly is liberating on multiple levels. Let's examine the three principles related to the painful impact of sin and disobedience in the church that Paul addresses. First, we see that divisive people hurt the body and not the leaders, as we read verse 5. Paul says, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, to put it, not, to, not to put it too severely, to all of you. You see, Paul is addressing the reality that's going on here that there was division in the church. If we read in 1 Corinthians, we see that there was this division of I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ. They were, they were looking to follow a particular, particular leader. And there was evidently someone in this Corinthians church that was trying to supplant Paul's biblical authority in their lives. And Paul confronted those issues. And he addressed those issues. And this, pers this divisive person was trying to create harm for Paul. But Paul says, look, he goes, if anyone has caused pain, if they're trying to hurt and cause pain, it's not me that they're ultimately hurting. It's the body that they're hurting. Divisiveness might have been directed towards the leadership, but the impact was felt among all of the people around. You know, often the church gets a bad rap in society. People say, I don't want to be a part of the organizational church or the institution of the church because they see people fighting and playing in a, in a very unkind and unchristlike way. And that's a really sad thing to see. But that doesn't change the reality that Jesus is the one who established the church and He established it for the purpose of living in community, to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to have ministry together. And you know something? The sharpening takes place through conflict. When we see metal scraping against metal, sparks fly. But we also know that the rubbing and the abrasion between the metal is a sharpening aspect. And so living in community and the difficulties that we have in living in community are actually good for our own personal spiritual growth and our corporate growth together. Because what it does is it keeps us from running away from problems. We don't have to look far to see how easy it is to try to run away from problems. 
We see it in interpersonal relationships of marriage. With a divorce rate of approximately 50% in America and the statistic not being that different among Christians, people are so easy when they have a difficult situation is to run away from conflict. And I don't say that as condemnation for anyone who has been through the painful process of divorce. You know, things have been done wrong against people. And so please don't receive this as condemnation against any person if they've been through that painful process. But it's really an observation of some tendencies that we see of avoiding conflict at all cost. We see it in churches as well. Often we're not seeing churches grow because of people coming to Jesus. We see churches grow because the deck is being shuffled. Now that's not to say that you're wrong because you've changed a church. Please don't misunderstand me. But what I am saying, it's so easy when we experience a difficulty in a group environment is to run away and avoid the pain. But what happens when we do that is we fail to grow and mature as people. And often if we're running away from something in a group, we will experience that same thing in an interpersonal way. If we do it in an interpersonal way, we'll carry it over into a group. So all of this is to say we're put together in conflict so that we can grow as human beings and have healthy relationships as a result. See, this person in the congregation in Corinth wanted to cause pain for Paul. And the reality is, is that people cause pain. You've probably heard it said, and I hope that you never hear it from me, because I don't want to be this type of person, is that, oh, ministry would be easy except for people. <laughs> I don't want to be that type of person because I don't want to see people as a necessary evil for ministry. People are at the center of what we do as human beings and what we do as Christ followers. We're called to invest in people and not see them as a burden that we have to deal with. But people do cause pain. And that is a reality. But Paul says, while people might be trying to cause me pain, I'm not the one who's ultimately hurt by the, these intentions. See, Paul chose to do something very radical. And I think all of us would benefit by, by emulating this radical behavior. A person in the church in Corinth tried to personally insult and offend Paul. And Paul personally chose not to take it personally. <laughs> you know, there will be people in your life, it might be in your family, in your marriage, among your colleagues, and they will say something to try to intentionally offend you. Intentionally to cause you pain and harm. But if you choose not to take it personally, it takes away the power of a person over you. You know, it's the most amazing thing. Sometimes, maybe I'm a little bit malicious in my way of dealing with things. When someone is really trying to insult me, is I just go out of my way to show that I'm not insulted. <laughs> because one is, I don't want it to contaminate me so that I become bitter and angry. You know, all of us can resort to bitterness and angeriness, anger. It's an easy thing to do. But when we choose not to take personal offense when someone is intending it to be offensive, we really take the high ground. And not only that, it becomes a model and an example to others how not to take offense and how not to let something intended to be divisive have a dividing impact in our lives. Now with this message, we need to understand that, that Paul, is, is a, his authority is attacked. And he's not taking offense at this. But what I, I don't want you to, um, uh, um, uh, to think about this is that doesn't mean that leadership isn't accountable. Leadership is accountable. There's just a process of accountability that takes place. You know, as a pastor and as elders, we have responsibility, God-given biblical responsibilities for leadership in the church. But that doesn't mean that we are above accountability. As a matter of fact, we are accountable to the body to walk and to minister as Jesus would. So it's not that we're beyond accountability, is we are accountable. It just means that accountability is important and that charges against leaders are serious and must be substantiated. And so Paul here, he is a leader and, and this person in Corinth is making accusations against him and that's a problem, but 
Paul chooses, even in the midst of these false accusations, not to take offense because he wants to build the body and he moves accordingly for the good of the body. What a great example, not only for leaders in the church, to choose not to take offense the way that Paul chose not to take offense. But what a great example for each one of us. If we could live our lives in our marriages, in our relationships with our children, in our parents, with our colleagues, and with strangers on the street to move in a way that we are not offended even if they try to provoke us to anger and intend to offend us. Well, Paul goes on in that verse as well. He says, you are the ones who are hurt. You corporately are hurt when this is taking place. And because this was taking place with this individual, there were some repercussions. This individual that was seeking to cause harm for Paul actually was hurting the body, and so there were some consequences that took place for that. You know, people do cause pain, but there are different types of pain that can take place. You know, there are scars from wounds, but there are also the spasms that can take place from a strained muscle. The second, the, the strained muscle requires more attention, a proactive prevention measures to, to ensure that you get better, like exercise and diet. You know, When I'm starting to have some back problems, it's, it's usually because I've been sedentary, I haven't been exercising, and I probably put on 10 pounds. And so there are things that I can do to, to deal with those, those back problems, those spasms that take place. But the, the scars that I have, those are from wounds that, are, that have healed and are gone. You know, at one time, if I used to touch that, it would kind of hurt because the scar was fresh. But that was 20, 30 years ago. So now it doesn't hurt when I touch it because it's completely healed. And so people will hurt us. So the question is, how are we responding? Um, you, know, the, you know, the scars can come from a variety of ways. They can come from accidents, from injuries, or it can come from surgery, something that was intentionally done to bring about restoration and healing in our lives. But, you know, other wounds, they can cycle back on us. You know, wounds that, that come back either because we go back to unhealthy practices. You know, I used to run on a regular basis, and so I was at the at top of my form. But when I stopped running, guess what? Some of those back problems started coming back again. So there are things that we can do which can recycle these, these painful things. We can put ourselves in dangerous environments where painful things take place. Or we can fail to deal with issues and painful things take place. So pain is a part of life. But the thing is that we need to understand is that when there is division in the body, the division isn't necessarily hurting the leaders. It's hurting all of us. So let's think about that and strive for unity versus division. The second principle that we see in this passage uh, is a culture of forgiveness that promotes peace and reconciliation. In verses 6 through 8, um, we, we see that discipline within the body is intended for restoration. Discipline within the body is intended not to, to, to hurt and to harm, but to create restoration. Uh, Paul writes in verse 6, he says, For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Now it's interesting as we, we break down this passage because church discipline or the, the punishment by the majority is intended to bring about repentance. Now it says, starts off says, for uh, such a one. Such a one is really referring to the person uh, that was under discipline in Corinth. This person that was attacking Paul and his authority was maligning Paul's character and was trying to hurt Paul but he chose not to take offense. He said, such a one, for such a one, the punishment of the majority is enough. You see, this person, such a one, is really referring to the, the repentant rebel. The person was rebelling against the authority of Paul, but clearly they had repented because it says... The punishment by the majority is enough. Now this is very interesting because punishment by the majority is this escalation to the level of church discipline where the whole congregation knows what's going on. Uh, the word is used only one time in the entire New Testament. It's, um, 
epitemia. Only one time in the New Testament this word for punishment. You see punishment a lot in the New Testament, but this word for punishment is, is unique because it's referring to the, the corporate dealing with the rebellious person. So it's specifically related to the context of church discipline. And he's saying that it's escalated to the level where the whole church is to know what's going on. We read about church discipline in Matthew 18. In verse 17 it says, If the person refuses to listen to the two or three, then tell it to the whole church. And so there's a process where things are taken care of individually and it can be reconciled very quickly. But if a person is resistant, then it needs to go between two or three people. And then if they, they still are resistant, then it has to be exposed to the whole church. In Corinth, it had escalated to this level because Paul talks about such a one as this. The punishment... The, the church discipline by the majority is sufficient. That means that this person has been repentant. They were re rebellious and they repented. Now Paul is moving on to restoration. He said, the, the punishment by the majority is enough. He says, so you should rather turn to and forgive and comfort him so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. You see, we saw that discipline in the body is intended for restoration, not for beating them up and putting them down. After the, the time of discipline has taken place, after that, 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 that discipline has been administered, now come alongside of that person and bring them back into the fold. Let them be restored. Let them be comforted. And let them be a, a part of the body again. Because... The tendency of the human being is to punish a person excessively. They've hurt me, so I want them to feel the hurt that I've, I've experienced. You know that eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Oh buddy, if somebody hurts me, I want to give them that eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth type of thing. But if you're the one doing the hurting, <laughs> you don't want that eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth type of thing. You want mercy. We want to declare justice, but we need mercy. And Paul is appealing to mercy in this context of the repentant rebel. This person was rebellious, but they were repentant. And so now is the time for them to extend mercy. It says, if not, they would be overwhelmed. When there is repentance and the process of restoration leads to forgiveness and comfort. It's interesting that the words that he uses in verse 7 uh, for forgiveness is uh, charizomai, which means to extend grace, unmerited favor. So when the person is repentant, you can show undeserved favor for this person. He also talks about that, that to extend this so that they might not be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. That word overwhelmed is an interesting word. It means to, to swallow or to drown or to be swallowed up. So a person, can you imagine a person who has sinned in the body and they've, they've resisted uh, the response of the individual, they've been taken to a group and they've still not acknowledged and repented their sin and then it get, becomes exposed to the whole congregation that this person has sinned. Now their sin is out there for everyone to see. It could have been dealt with at this level if they would have repented, but they continue to resist. And because of love, they've been exposed to the, the whole crowd. And now the crowd has, is aware of this person's sin and they're praying for this person. And at that point they repent and they said, I was wrong. I shouldn't have been maligning character, Paul's character. I shouldn't have been accusing him falsely. I was wrong to try and hurt the Apostle Paul. At this point, this is the, the specific case of discipline that was brought about. But now he's saying, that the church is saying, okay, he's repentant. Now it's like, boy, you hurt us. Look, you caused us to go backwards. Look at the negative testimony that we have in the community because we are all divisive. And they want to continue to punish this brother. It says, don't do that because he might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. He might be swallowed up, drowned by all of this pain. You see, once a person repents, that allows there to be restoration. No longer beating a person down. No longer rubbing their noses in it. Can I be a little bit graphic with y'all today? A little bit? Uh, yesterday, yesterday I was doing some stuff around the house. And um, I was moving some stuff from the garage um, to the shed out back. And so I had things in the staging area in the kitchen. And I had this box of sports gear. It was, a, it was kind of a torn up box. And so I set it on the back porch. And I went back in the house less than 15 seconds. 
to get a second box and I see my son's dog peeing on the box. <laughs> I was mad. That dog shouldn't pee on my stuff. So I took that dog and I took him over there and I rubbed his nose in it as I was spanking him saying, No! Don't you pee on my stuff! And I rubbed his nose in it. Now, so we have a tendency to want to do that to people. They sin. They messed up. They've repented. Now the dog couldn't repent. But we want to have a tendency to take people who've repented and rub their noses in their sin. And that's not what Paul is saying here. He says, discipline is intended for restoration. Divisive people hurt the body, but the discipline is intended for restoration when there's repentance. And forgiveness benefits both parties, the offender and the offended. You know, it's interesting because it talks about um, forgive and comfort. If you remember in the first part of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we looked at comfort. And the word was parakaleo, to, to come alongside. Holy Spirit is referred to the comforter. And so now we see comfort again. And it's interesting because the word that they, they use in verse 8 says, So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Beg is actually a derivative of the word comfort. It's an it's a urging, it's an exhortation. And it's from the same root as comfort. It's a very interesting thing that we see here. To reaffirm your love for Him. Now the word for love is a word that you're probably familiar with. And if you've been in church in any time, it's the word agape. It's the unconditional love. So he says, you don't love Him because you love this person unconditionally with the God-like love that's saying, I'm not going to make sure that you get all your act together. If you're repentant, I'm going to love you unconditionally. It's the unconditional love. I, I, I actually misspoke there. I'm loving you unconditionally. And so they still might be messing up, but the love is unconditional to help bring that person back in to restoration in the communion, in the body. I got, a poach, uh, I got to confess that I poached a quote that uh, our brother Tom Hess had on his Facebook this, this week. He said his favorite qu quote from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. When I read that, I said, I like that. That's a great quote. I'm going to use that this Sunday. So, so thanks, Tom. You know, it's that constant attitude of forgiveness that we need to have. And think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., what he went through constantly being harassed for, for taking a stand for righteousness. He had to continually forgive people. And that's something that we need to often do as well. Continually forgive people because people will hurt us again and again. Forgiveness means foregoing the right to personally punish an individual for harm received. So when I forgive a person, I'm foregoing the right to personally punish a person for the harm that I have received. But forgiveness does not imply an immediate restoration of trust. We're commanded to love. We must love. But trust is something that is earned. It's, it's earned over time. And so restoration is an important part, process that we need to go through when there is sin. We need to love. We need to forgive. We need to forgo the right to punish a person that has hurt us. This can be hard, especially for us individually. When we've been wounded very deeply by, by someone close to us, someone that we respect, someone that we care about, we want them to feel the pain that we have felt. It's easy to go the route of, of tit for tat, giving the person the same that they gave me. If they give me the cold shoulder, I'm going to give them the iceberg shoulder. If they explode with anger, I'm going to be a nuclear bomb. But forgiveness says, I'm going to absorb the wrong because I love the person. Love forgives. Love forgives the right to punish for wrong done. But that doesn't mean that we trust immediately. And so if you've been on the forgiving end, I had a person said, hey, 
You have to trust me. I said, brother, I don't have to trust you. <laughs> I have to love you, but I don't trust you. I told him. I looked him in the face. I said, I don't trust you. You've proven yourself to be a person who is not worthy of trust, but I love you and I will work with you and I will give you the opportunity to reestablish trust. So we can establish pathways for building trust as well. So we've seen that Divisive people hurt the body, not the leaders. Discipline within the body is intended for restoration. And thirdly, we need to see the third principle that we discover in an effort to walk in biblical truth is that we will face satanic opposition. And Satan's plan is to divide the body through disobedience. And we read in verses 9 through 11. For this is why I wrote that I must test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. For anyone whom you forgive... I also forgive. Indeed, I have forgiven. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. This is a very, very rich section. Uh, three things that, that I discover from this passage as we see about Satan's plan to divide through disobedience is, is the first part is that obedience is essential to maintain order in body life. Obedience is essential to maintain order in body life. You see... Paul writes to say, I'm right to test whether, to know whether you are obedient in everything. Paul wants to see whether the Corinthians are obedient, whether they're listening to the Word of God, first and foremost, and if they're listening to the spiritual leaders under the authority of Christ. Now, be careful for a person who sets themselves up as a spiritual authority and they prop themselves up over Scripture. Anybody who does that is disobedient to Scripture and needs to be discounted. So if I ever say, listen to me because I'm your pastor, that, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not based on listen to the Word of God, then don't listen to what I'm saying. I am submitted to the authority of God's Word. And so listen to me as I'm operating under the authority of God's Word. If I ever exalt myself over the authority of God's Word, do me a favor and remove me from this pulpit. Because that dishonors my head, Jesus Christ. And it dishonors His Word. So obedience is important. And Paul addresses that in this context. He wanted to see if they were obedient to everything, to the Word of God and to the authority of the leadership under the authority of Christ. And he says, as well, forgiveness is an important part. Forgiveness is essential to maintain fellowship in body life. While obedience is essential to maintain order, forgiveness is essential to maintain fellowship. The choice to forgive is a sign of maturity. And the choice to forgive is a sign of humility, honoring Christ. You see, we all have choices. And we can choose to forgive or we can choose to withhold forgiveness. But if we withhold forgiveness, we are really punishing ourselves. Because if we withhold forgiveness, we're choosing to embrace bitterness. And bitterness is like a cancer to our soul. But if we choose to forgive, it shows that we have a level of maturity that will help us overcome bitterness and overcome the pain. Forgiveness is the healing balm for the wounds that we have. And also, it is a sign of honoring Christ. It is a sign of honoring Christ because we're humbling ourselves and saying, I trust Jesus to take care of this matter. I'm not going to withhold forgiveness because I trust Jesus to deal with my pain and to deal with the wrongs that I've encountered. I trust Jesus to overcome the wrongs that I have done in dealing with others as well. Forgiveness is a choice a sign of humility and maturity. And thirdly, we see from this passage that says that he doesn't want the Christians to be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Discernment is essential to maintain unity in the body. This is the principle that I learned from this passage. You know, he says, don't be outwitted. You know, it's so easy to be proud and cocky, which is dangerous. And this is different from being Christ confident. So he says, I don't want you to be outwitted. You know, it's interesting because this word outwitted is used four times out of the five times in the New Testament right here in 2 Corinthians. It means to defraud, to cheat, to take advantage of. 
So Paul doesn't want them to be, uh, to be taken advantage of and to be cheated by the enemy, Satan. He wants them to be aware. He says, we're not ignorant of these things. We're not agnostic. We're not, we don't uh, not know what's going on. But you know, the thing is, is that sometimes we can know what's going on, but function like we don't know what's going on. You know, being passive is dangerous. You know, they weren't ignorant, but emotional harm done to us can create a context where we act in a way that is contrary to knowledge. You see, freedom forgives us from emotional and spiritual bondage. Satan's scheme is to outwit. The word for scheme here is um, noema, and it actually comes from the Greek word for mind or thought. And so Satan's purposes or designs were plots to deceive the believers, to divide them, to let, let them be disobedient. And his plans were to divide the body through disobedience. And this is a scheme that he has. It makes me think of the passage in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, where, talking about the full armor of God, where it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes, the noema, of the devil. We have an enemy of our souls who wants to divide, to, to destroy us individually, and he wants to divide us corporately. And Paul shows how we can overcome the schemes of the enemy through forgiveness. And this is good news. This is a message of hope. This is a message that can change our lives if we will live into the forgiveness that God has for us. Let us pray. Father, as we consider these words, a picture of Paul dealing with the church in Corinth, he shows about forgiveness and how that plays itself out in the body, how he isn't individually forgave and how the church was able to minister discipline and forgive. But it applies to us today as well, Lord. We're hurt sometimes and we're wounded. And we need to experience your healing and forgiveness in our lives. So Lord, help us to know the areas that we might be hurting. Where we need to extend forgiveness. Where we might need to receive forgiveness. And help us to, to apply those ways in our lives this day. So that we can leave this place free from emotional bondage. From spiritual bondage. And can be about your purposes for us. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.